Okay, so uh, today we're very happy to have uh, Yasaman Barry uh, from Google Brain. Uh, she's uh, a physicist by training uh, from Berkeley, but then shifted her focus uh, from uh, physics to uh, machine learning and in particular to neural nets. And uh, her research was about connecting um, statistical physics and neural networks. And she has had many amazing results in that area. So today we're very happy to have her and uh, she's going to tell us about the scaling laws of neural nets, which is uh, a very hot topic these days with uh, many mysteries and results. And she's going to tell us, you know, from a scientific point of view, what is happening. Um, thank you, uh, Amin, for the kind introduction and also for setting very high expectations uh, for the talk. Um, I hope I don't disappoint no you too much. Um, so uh, yeah, I'll, I'll say a few words about dynamics and then mostly focus on scaling laws in this talk and I'll introduce um, what that refers to. Um, for folks who maybe just to uh, get everybody situated thinking about the same topic. Um, this talk focuses on deep neural networks. There's a very rich, they're a very rich class of function approximators as, as we know, and they've emerged as a general tool across many different settings. Um, and I've pulled some that maybe uh, you've, you've heard about, but anything from uh, detecting diabetic retinopathy uh, in computer vision um, based off of images of the retina all the way to um, making predictions for protein folding, um, all using sort of the same uh, complex set of models underpinning um, uh, the, the systems that were built. So um, the sorts of questions I'm interested in are, can we understand some aspects of these complex models in more depth? And what do I mean by understand? So um, as you'll see in this talk and most of my work, um, I kind of, uh, 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 I try to, uh, I see myself as working sort of between theory and experiment a little bit. Um, so historically kind of machine learning drawing from stats and CS, um, uh, there's a great interest in um, having rigorous kind of guarantees for what happens in algorithms um, and what happens statistically. Um, my, my style of work is maybe not as rigorous, but I hope to maybe kind of try to distill uh, what happens mechanistically in more complex models. And I see myself as maybe filling in a gap between pure theoreticians who can prove, who can maybe take some of those ideas and prove more rigorous results off of them and folks who are more on the practical side. Um, so uh, I'll just spend two slides kind of just giving a few highlights, recent highlights from the past few years on um, theoretical, in the theoretical description of neural networks. Um, a lot of theory has uh, been based off of kind of the results in this area, um, some that we've worked on and many others have worked on as well. Um, I'll make a few just kind of remarks on where I think things are going or promising directions, again, for, for understanding uh, kind of the feature learning that's going on in neural networks in a bit more detail, and then I'll um, shift focus to trying to understand, see what we can understand about scaling laws um, and what can we say about them. Um, so I will be mostly model agnostic in this talk unless I specify, but um, just to give you um, kind of a refresh on a vanilla, what a vanilla neural network, deep neural network would look like, um, it consists of, in its most uh, kind of vanilla, fully connected flavor, it consists of just a series of affine transformations followed by, by point-wise application of nonlinearities repeated some number of times across many different layers. So you take some potentially high dimensional input, uh, you have parameters of the networks, which are like the, the weights and the biases, which construct form the affine transformation, and then you also have a choice of nonlinearity that you're applying um, in each of these layers. Um, two important uh, architectural components here, in addition to the specifics, the, the detailed specifics of how this affine transformation is done. One is that the, the width of the hidden layers, uh, N here plays a role, as well as the depth. And those are two kind of more significant hyperparameters that I'll 
sometimes referenced in this talk. Um, and so we'll be uh, mostly just studying empirical risk minimization um, for supervised learning uh, under gradient descent, or it could be stochastic gradient descent with, uh, unless I know it otherwise, fairly general choice of loss function data and architecture. Um, so this is a slide of some of the existing results, which uh, I think experts in the audience might be very familiar with, uh, but I thought I would try to just kind of disseminate it to a broader audience. Um, there's been a, a kind of a flurry of work on um, studying the infinitely wide limit of deep neural networks. So what happens when you fix the depth, uh, going back to this picture, so fixed depth, but take the width to be, uh, to be large uh, and approaching infinity. And then you can make a lot of exact statements uh, about um, the network at initialization, as well as what happens under uh, gradient descent training. So uh, for example, um, at initialization, if you want to talk about the prior over functions that a, neuro, a deep neural network realizes, it maps over exactly to a Gaussian process with particular mean and covariance functions that describe that Gaussian process. And the novel, the novelty here uh, is sort of what is the form of that Gaussian process. Um, the covariance function, uh, both the mean, but also in particular the covariance function, takes inherits a compositional form that comes from the composition that occurs in a deep network. And so there's a recursion relation that you can write down for what this covariance function or kernel function is. So if you have this, this object K, uh, which is a covariance function, it's a function of two arguments, X and X prime. If you have it at layer L minus one, uh, you can write down uh, what this map is that takes you from layer L minus one to layer L. This gives you a complete description once you iterate it, you know, um, D times, if D is the depth of the network, it gives you a complete description of that GP. And uh, these recursion relations um, uh, for kind of simple networks and in particular for some nonlinearities, you can write them, you can calculate them exactly. So write them down in closed form. And this has kind of been a useful tool for then analyzing sort of the, the spectral decomposition and so on of these kernel functions uh, in this limit. But in any case, so this mapping over to a GP, uh, it allows you then, for instance, to do things like exact Bayesian inference, if you like using just the standard um, kind of toolbox of GPs. Um, the next sort of big development uh, in this area uh, was to study though what happens um, to such networks uh, under gradient descent evolution. So um, if you, I've written it here um, kind of without wanting to spend too much time on the notation, I've written here uh, in continuous time, uh, the, the dynamics for the function f of x um, that, that the model uh, captures. So the model is, um, uh, is, is learning a function, let's say just a, a scalar function f of x uh, with parameters theta sub mu. So some collection of parameters theta sub mu um, in this network. Um, but if you look at the evolution equation for the function, for, for the model in function space, uh, here again, written only in continuous time, you can uh, write something similar in discrete time. Uh, you see that it's controlled by this uh, quantity big theta. Um, if you want to factor out the part where the loss depends on the function and then everything else that is model dependent. And this big theta, uh, just by uh, uh, definition here, is um, an inner product over the uh, model gradients with respect to parameters. So df d theta are the, are the uh, gradients of the model. Um, and forming this inner product gives you a kernel in general, this kernel is a dynamical quantity. And so if you knew how this was evolving, you could say some things about how, what the actual model learns. Um, and it turns out though, that uh, in this infinite width limit, this quantity doesn't evolve at all. It's frozen at its initial value, um, and uh, which I've kind of written in this box equation, theta t equals theta naught. Um, and in that case, then you can um, kind of solve this um, differential equation exactly uh, 
and get um, exact results for, for uh, how the model evolves, what the predictions are as a function of time. Uh, and, and just because it's, it amounts to kind of kernel regression, if you're using, um, let's say, uh, squared loss, you can also, uh, you can ask about what the kind of effective model is in parameter space. And because of the equivalence between kernels and linear models, you can come up with the right set of features here. Uh, you can kind of guess that it's going to be related to the gradients. And indeed, if you ask about um, what does this model look like in parameter space, space, it amounts to a linear model with a very particular set of features that correspond to the gradients. Um, so in this limit, uh, training a deep neural network uh, that's infinitely wide is equivalent to a first order Taylor expansion. And so these are things that, um, that have been studied and are used and uh, these sorts of models um, as I'll also do myself uh, and, and later on when I talk about scaling laws, we use them sort of as plug-in substitutes for studying uh, uh, more complex neural networks. So they're kind of a zeroth order approximation to that, um, but there's a lot that they don't capture. Um, and I want to make a couple comments on that um, before moving on. Uh, but this is kind uh, of a, a different. Can I can I just ask a question um, in, uh, for the previous uh, in the previous slide? Uh, so the first result, which is a Ga uh, you know a Gaussian process, right? Here you assume that it is infinitely wide, correct? Yes. And then you and then the second one is basically what happens if you apply you train it. The yeah, the second line is actually general. Uh, the, the second line was just a comment um, about how to rewrite it in function space. And then the third line also is just uh, infinite width. Right, so what, I'm, uh, what I wanna understand is that how you, from, uh, from a Gaussian process, how do you get to a neural tangent kernel? Uh, so the, the, um, the Gaussian process is, is what was known was that it's the description at initialization. Uh -huh. Then I mentioned that if you do gradient descent training in general, not just infinite width, this is just the evolution equation for the function. Right. It's told right. by the neural tangent kernel as a dynamical quantity. And then, um, uh, and then the result from uh, this NTK literature is that this object is frozen, but you know that it's the thing that controls the dynamics. And then if you put the two together, you know it starts out as a GP, it evolves in a particular way. You can calculate the final, it actually is still a GP and you can calculate the final GP, which actually involves a blend of both the NTK and this other kernel in the, in the final predictions. I see. May I ask one more question? Yes. So at this point, um, the equation you have at the bottom right, the Taylor expansion is around a specific point yes so how does that lead to a global um, optimum meaning uh, you started by saying that this is all about function approximation so. it, it does yeah it, it doesn't i guess it, it only ends up exploring so it's a it's a limited form of training although in that limit you have in principle infinitely many parameters and you should uh, have a lot of flexibility about what you end up, um, what you're able to approximate because of the dynamics, uh, you're effectively restricted to just this basin around the initial point. So, so this is just a confirmation that you get a, a local minimum around the initial point. And then if you want to explore the space, you have to just start from other random points and keep doing this. Yes, yeah, but, but maybe uh, I guess there are, I think Amin is even more of an expert on this topic than I am, but maybe it's not so bad that the limiting dynamics here is kind of regularizing the problem. Um, so rather than have arbitrary exploration, if you, if you then move away from this limit and then ask about, uh, you know, it, it maybe provides some control for then what's happening as you move away from this limit is maybe the, the point I, I would make, I, I would suggest. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions about this? Um, 
So, so yeah, that's that's exactly right. Um, in this limit, just because it's a dynamic, it's an effect of the dynamics. It's related actually to how we initialize models. We pick things with a very particular scale. Um, and then when there are restrictions also on the learning rate, then you end up basically just having this model effectively, this um, uh, very regularized uh, co or convex kind of optimization problem. Um, so uh, this has been known now uh, for a little bit and what's beyond this, because this doesn't, um, this captures some things. And as I mentioned, it's it's a very nice kind of, it, it, it captures some zeroth order complexities about models. For instance, these random features or these kernels, they, um, they inherit the compositionality of the architecture. So, uh, and they're not necessarily poorly performing models. So some of these kernel methods derived from these models can perform well, um, but they don't capture the thing that we think is special about deep learning, which is feature learning, um, that you're doing something other than a linear model. You don't, you're not just dealing with fixed uh, frozen features at initialization. Um, but this limit uh, can then serve as a starting point for trying to derive uh, the dynamics uh, about infinite width. So um, maybe some, there's a set of techniques um, in physics and maybe nor, known a, a little bit more generally um, called perturbation theory. Uh, this is just that you, if you have an exactly solvable limit, you can try to organize um, kind of a series expansion uh, about that. So, so if you know infinite width limit, you can compute the, the leading order correction and the next leading order correction and so on. Um, and so this, uh, these things, um, this, uh, these exact results have been used for various um, expansions of this form. So one over width corrections, depth over width corrections and so on. And um, there's, uh, this is kind of a, a, a actively studied area, so I, I won't say more about it. Um, and then there are things that are maybe beyond perturbation theory. So things that even with this exact solution, even if you tried to organize an expansion about it, you would not be able to capture um, with, a, with an approximate model some other kind of dynamics. And one thing that we worked on was that, um, was uh, studying more carefully how these um, dynamics actually break. So I'm this dynamics on the previous page that I referred to as the neural tangent kernel, it actually requires a critical learning rate to hold, um, uh, or, or it requires the learning rate that you use in gradient descent to be less than a, a critical value, uh, where that critical value is two over lambda naught. Lambda naught is an eigenvalue of, of, of a quantity. Um, and so even in infinite width, um, you know, as you make networks wider, when the learning rate is less than this critical value, you recover, you approach this NTK description that I mentioned. But if your learning rate is between uh, above this value and below some other value uh, that we can pinpoint, C is some constant that's greater than two, um, then you actually get very different dynamics. What you get is effectively you catapult out of this initial basin uh, as, as was um, asked about where you have an expansion, you know, like a first order Taylor expansion about the basin, you catapult out of this and then go to some other in, in a very short amount of time at the beginning of training, and then you explore some other basin um, uh, where you then kind of converge uh, at late times, sort of like a linear model. Um, and so uh, I guess the, the kind of thing that I maybe want to um, highlight is that there are a lot of knobs uh, in deep neural networks that you can uh, tune. Uh, I've listed some of the most important ones or the ones that we think might be most important, depth with data set size and learning rate. Um, and all of these knobs, they kind of control where you are relative to these uh, kind of infinite width results um, and, and other limiting solutions. So for instance, it's not just the width that matters, the learning rate also matters. Um, the quantity that maybe controls how far away you are is not just width, but really depth over width, that ratio and so on. And so um, maybe it's helpful just to keep in the back of your mind uh, something that uh, you've seen in maybe chemistry, these phase diagrams, uh, where if you have multiple kind of variables to tune, some regions of this uh, kind of 
uh, phase space are, are, are better approximated by certain kinds of limiting solutions and other regions of the phase space uh, are going to be uh, captured by other limiting solutions and there are maybe connections between them if you tune appropriately and so on. But these are some of the four, at least these four seem to be some of the most important factors I think that control how much feature learning you're actually doing. Any questions on this slide? Um, just one thing, when you uh, go out of, like when the learning rate is between two and C, um, can you pinpoint where you go? It's hard to say, uh, you mean mathematically, say anything about where it's going. Like, yeah, so is it like, um, yeah, right, maybe, uh, yeah, I, I don't know, right? So I, I'm like, uh, is there any, can you do any function approximation of where you're ending up or what you are learning? We, uh, we so it, it's hard to say thing, we've only been able to study it in the most simple mathematical, uh, mathematical in the simplest cases. So what the, and the, there are probably better techniques for studying this. What we did was, uh, and this would be a whole nother talk, but um, some of these equations, uh, there's a whole set of coupled equations that you would have to consider for function dynamics. And um, we can solve, you know, because we're somewhat limited maybe by our theoretical techniques, we can solve um, uh, limiting cases of them where we can close the equations, basically reduce it to a small number of variables and then solve them. And, and um, they're really for just very simple models. For all the other models, we've studied it kind of, we've resorted to numerics. So it's one area that I, I think uh, it would be nice to have um, uh, more kind of uh, more rigorous study um, to see what can be said about how the kernel changes. What we do know is that the kernel changes by a lot and it's really like a phase transition because on one side, the kernel doesn't change at all in the limiting case. And on the other side, the kernel changes by like an order one amount in the limiting case in, in the infinite width limit. Um, but more specific than that, not so much. I, I suspect that there are, um, you know, this limiting dynamics, which is not, it's different from NTK. It, it requires like a infinite width and a long time limit together. Um, describe some types of feature learning, but the other types of feature learning that maybe for most practical models we care about, which involve depth and width. I don't know if this sort of limiting dynamics would describe those. Oh, that's so amazing. So, uh, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, thanks for the questions. Um, it's okay if we don't get to the end of the talk, I guess. Uh, um, so uh, now that was just to kind of a primer on other stuff that I've worked on, st stuff that's been known um, uh, and the community has um, uh, worked on quite a bit. Um, now I wanna go in a direction that is more exploratory um, or e even more exploratory and, and you'll see what I mean. Um, so the motivation for um, uh, the second part of the talk is comes really from empirics. So um, uh, there's been a lot of, or some empirical work recently that's shown that in a lot of cases in practice, neural network performance um, obeys smooth power law trends as a function of these three basic variables. So data set size, model size, and amount of compute. Um, and you can see that in these plots below. This is just one example. It's um, drawn from, this. these plots are taken from um, uh, an open AI paper um, where they've made uh, measurements of these things. Um, this is for uh, um, a particular language model. Um, and these, the measurements of these um, kind of trends um, was useful to them to find kind of the, the most efficient way to scale up their existing language models to produce GPT-3. So what I mean by that is that, you know, there's some trade-off between compute and the model size and the amount of data and um, kind of figuring out where in that multi-dimensional space, how you want to uh, increase, you know, how you want to devote resources to um, scaling up the model. Uh, there, there are better, there are good ways to do that if you study these laws. Um, and so they use that to kind of 
do informative scaling for to construct GPT-3, uh, which was um, their long their largest language model. Um, I'll use the term scaling laws to refer to this just because um, the, the literature has started using that, but it really ties in um, to, of course, a lot of work, a really rich theoretical literature on just generalization. Uh, I mean, that's been studied um, for, for quite a long time, and also a lot of people thinking about it for neural networks. Um, maybe, so one thing I'll kind of distinguish here is that um, uh, the goal is maybe to, to kind of understand um, how performance improves, not just with data set size, uh, which is maybe the, the thing that's most often studied um, in, 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 on the theoretical side, but also with parameters and, and also with compute. Um, for this talk, I'll fo focus on just data set size and parameters. Um, and also maybe uh, to distinguish a bit from um, those other works, uh, the goal here maybe is trying to see if we can say anything more about what happens empirically uh, in practice, um, rather than just, uh, rather than kind of having guarantees on what happens. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, not just the, the worst case um, setting, but kind of the average case, can we, can we understand where these numbers are coming from? Are they too dependent on the details of the problem or can we at least extract something roughly for, for what governs them? And you'll see that we can make some progress on this, but there's a lot more um, that we, we don't understand. And so, um, and maybe that will encourage others to, to work on this problem too. So can we better understand why these trends emerge empirically, why it tends to be most often the case that you see these uh, kind of just single trends rather than multiple uh, power law or other regions? And what features of the data and models uh, determine these exponents? And in particular, uh, what's the kind of the mechanism that's controlling scaling? And we'll see that at least as a first kind of uh, first pass at this problem, there are some regimes where there's a universal exponent and others where it's non-universal. And then we could try to focus on uh, what governs that non-universal aspect of it. Um, we started working on this by uh, examining uh, a very simple setting where we have a full handle on the problem. Um, so that's a setting where we, uh, it's very, uh, it's very simple. It's a student teacher setup, which is um, kind of a common toy uh, toy thing and, and also random features. So we'll have linear models that are constructed from random features. They could be any random features uh, like neural net features, uh, like the ones that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, and in that setting, we because we can solve for the, for the test loss exactly, um, then we kind of have a full handle on the, the various regimes. Um, but then we use that as kind of uh, a starting point for uh, kind of um, hypothesizing what happens in the more general setting. So we have some handles there um, and in others we don't, we'll try to empirically test some connections to um, measurable quantities, as I'll, as I'll show you. Um, okay, so the setup for this problem, um, uh, or the thing, the thing that we want to study, these scaling laws, um, uh, is, is the following. So I'm going to use D and P um, in this um, regular font to denote uh, the training set size for some data set, um, curly D, and P is the number of model parameters. Um, although we'll mostly just focus on scaling with the layer width, uh, because that's where we, the reason for that is just because that's where we have uh, more of a theoretical understanding uh, that I mentioned that comes from uh, the first part of the, the first few slides. Um, so in, in those cases, you can just substitute, you know, width is square root of, uh, of P, um, roughly. Um, and uh, we're going to be setting the, the test loss as a function of these two variables, D and P, uh, averaged over the choice of the data set and the random initializations, if, if there is one, uh, so like theta naught. So um, we're just setting kind of not even test, but the, the population uh, loss. Uh, so XY is drawn from some distribution. 
D is again this data set. We have some loss function, and in general, we'll keep the loss function general unless I mention that we we do um, MSC in particular, um, which we do for the student teacher setting. And we um, what we're interested in extracting from this is just the leading order kind of uh, D and P dependence. Um, so there are some constants at D and P going to infinity. Um, uh, and we won't be able to be in, the, in this talk, I won't say much about the constants. Um, we don't know much about them, but because our focus was trying to understand the, the efficiency of the approach, we'll focus just on the exponents, alpha D and alpha P. So um, in investigating this, we uh, came up kind of building off of this uh, simple setting and then something that we can actually generalize. We identified a categorization of exponents based on their origin. So um, some of, sometimes these exponents are kind of just controlled by fluctuations, uh, like, uh, like a variance, um, when you're smoothly approaching a limit. It's sort of like a concentration of the function or the gradients about some limit. Um, and, uh, and, and that's what controls then how uh, kind of the, the, the efficient, the complexity, sample or parameter complexity. And so we termed this, these regimes kind of variance limited regimes just to denote, distinguish that they come more from these statistical fluctuations. And um, for, for this, uh, in this regime, you get um, an integer exponent equal to one asymptotically. If you're non-asymptotic, you can get other exponents, but at least as you approach the limit, um, uh, you get um, exponent one. Then uh, to different from that, we kind of categorized a different, we identified a different regime, which we termed resolution limited. And the kind of main um, picture here is, is one that uh, you're more familiar with, or you're also familiar with uh, for some variables. And the main idea here is that when you have these two variables, D and P, so amount of data and model size, um, when one variable is uh, not a bottleneck, so say it's quite large or you effectively take it to infinity, you wanna study scaling as a function of the other variable. So let's say P is quite large, you, know, you, have, you have quite a large model and um, you wanna study um, D scaling, so amount of data. Um, what this vary or, or vice versa, um, maybe D is quite large and P is small and you're studying scaling of P. So this variable, um, which could be training data or parameters, as I mentioned, what it's doing, it seems it's, it's serving to improve the resolution of some manifold. Um, and that's kind of what you expect when you're kind of fitting something. Uh, but I'm going to argue that this picture kind of holds whether you use D, whether uh, you interchange D and P, whether D is much smaller than P and you study D scaling or vice versa. Um, and in this regime, you get, uh, in general, non-integer, non-trivial exponents. These were the numbers that I showed earlier. So this, these are the two kind of uh, categorizations we want to work with, where we think there are two different mechanisms that control um, uh, how you're, what's governing scaling. So uh, just to go again into more detail um, from that previous slide on what the definition of these two regimes um, is, in this variance limited regime, you fix one of D or P, and then you let the other variable grow and you study scaling with respect to that variable. So for instance, let's fix the amount of data. Um, let's take P larger than D and then study P scaling. Or vice versa, let's fix P to some finite value. Uh, let's take D larger than P and study D scaling. Um, and so uh, if you were gonna make a two by two table, uh, showing what you're scaling and um, whether you're in a whether D is larger than P or P is larger than D, this variance limited regime would fall on the diagonals. Um, now, in this other regime, resolution limited, you take one of these D or P to be if, to be quite large, effectively much larger than the other variable. So it's no longer a bottleneck on the problem. Let's say you're not data limited, you're not model lim limited, and then the other, the other variable serves as your bottleneck. Um, so for instance, 
take some p could be infinite, could be finite. Um, uh, take d smaller than p and study d scaling. So here d is sort of the bottleneck, uh, or vice versa. And in this two by two table, because um, I'll start showing a lot of two by two uh, figures, resolution limited will lie on the off diagonals. Um, any questions about this categorization? So what you see also is that we don't capture these, uh, it's difficult for us to capture these um, intermediate regimes where D and P are either scaled together or um, yeah, or are, or are on the same order. Where we have control and some understanding in, in our work is in these kind of asymptotic regimes where one is much larger than the other. And that could be under or over parameterized. Um. The issue that I have is that in the underparameterized regime, well, you know, the, the error cannot go to zero. Uh, to zero. That that's right. But then your your scaling law was like going L was going uh, to zero. We maybe I I will sub, be subtracting off. So these maybe um, these constants. I see. I see. Okay. Right. Right. Yeah, okay. will be subtracted off. So okay. it's only the approach to the limit that we will study, not the right, constants right, right. itself. Yeah. And the constants are important. Um, I mean, they're in some ways they're more important, like they're they're equally important, if not more. Um, uh, but that was when we studied this. Our we had focused just on this, and I think um, it would be nice to have more insight into these constants. Um, any other questions? Okay, so just to display um, uh, empirically what these regimes would look like. So this is just for, for neural networks across different data sets, different models and different loss functions, um, uh, matching this two by two table. So on the diagonals, we have variance limited regime um, where uh, you can see we've subtracted off the, the infinite value, um, the, the limiting value. Um, which sometimes we have access to just from uh, these exact results from, from NTK. Um, but uh, here, so you see that these exponents um, are numerically fairly close to one. And then on the off diagonals, you have these exponents that in general are just uh, kind of different numbers. They're, um, they're, they, they might be less than one, um, uh, but they, they vary depending on the data set and the model and so on. Um, but, but here, uh, kind of this is maybe to draw your attention to the fact that uh, these exponents can be close to one kind of regardless of what uh, the choice of model data set or even loss function is. And then in these other regimes, there is quite a bit uh, more dependence. Um, just to, uh, on the numerical side, to kind of uh, show how these exponents are extracted. So you can um, look at both just the, the, the loss or the error, um, the final value or even the best value. And at least in these experiments, they tended to scale the same. Um, and so that's how we extracted these exponents. But this, these plots on the right are just to show you that um, sometimes in, in this, in these experiments, the, the scaling was rather similar. Okay, so uh, this categorization, uh, where did it come from and what kind of support do we have for it? Um, so uh, in the, as I mentioned, we'll study the student teacher random feature setting exactly, um, where we have derivations for all four regimes. Um, and uh, in this setting, we can relate the exponents to properties of, uh, of, a, of the random feature kernel that you would construct um, out of the, the random features. And uh, these exponents then in that case will be related to um, the, the eigenvalue spectrum of the kernel, which generically uh, goes as a power law. So it's that power law, at least in this setting, that controls these exponents. And we'll also see that um, in this setting, uh, the, there's actually an inequality between the model and data set size scaling. Uh, 
which we call the duality, but it's just that they take on the same value uh, because they're governed by the same thing. And then um, some of this will try to uh, loosen um, some of these restrictions and test uh, these predictions outside of this framework in this um, pre-training and fine-tuning setting, which is not exactly covered by this theoretical setup, but, um, but it seems that uh, at least in this setting, uh, we can get some agreement um, from, uh, from this theory. And then we'll try to generalize it to the, the more general setting where uh, we have just uh, any neural network um, and so on. And the variance limited regime, in that case, we have a formal proof for this exponent equal to one, but for the resolution limited regime, uh, at the moment, it's more of a hypothesis. I'll try to build some uh, kind of draw from a few intuitive pictures and then show some um, empirical measurements um, there. So where is it that we have um, a full handle? It's in this um, simple setting where we um, consider um, squared loss. We have a linear teacher model that we construct from fixed features, F sub M, um, potentially infinite. So the teacher model, um, F sub M, these could be neural network, random features, um, or so on, or uh, anything really. And, and the teacher weights uh, are just drawn from uh, a normal distribution. And then the student model is a linear model um, where you have parameters theta that you're trying to learn, um, but the features uh, of the student model are also constructed um, from the teacher features. There's some projection of the teacher features. Um, so you're drawing from the same set of kind of uh, random feature functions. And um, we, in this case, because you have squared error and, and it's all linear, uh, you can solve for the test loss exactly and we um, analyze these expressions in terms of the various gram matrices that would be you would construct from these features as, and the projection matrices and extract um, the leading term. And so I won't uh, go through those, those details so much, but just say the, the results. So there you can see the variance limited exponent equal to one um, kind of appear explicitly. It comes from fluctuations of the finite size covariance matrix about the limiting covariance. And then in the resolution limited um, regime, what we do is plug in an onsatz. So um, the, the kernel spectrum uh, will appear in the result. Um, and uh, we assume that, um, and I'll try to justify that this is empirically at least a, a, a decent assumption, um, we'll assume that the eigenvalues satisfy uh, a power law kind of decay. Um, so lambda sub i goes like um, uh, decays with an exponent that goes like one plus alpha k. And so if you assume that, um, then the um, exponents uh, for the data set size and the model size scaling uh, explicitly depend on this um, eigenvalue scaling uh, and alpha k appears here. And so you see that the, you know, the kernel spectrum uh, being a power law gives rise here to this power law, uh, to these power laws, and that the exponents themselves are, are governed by that and are equal to each other. So um, here, is, uh, some, here are some numerics that uh, match with that, again, in this um, uh, simple setting. So what's happening here is we take some um, data like MNIST, uh, pass it through some um, neural network random features and construct a teacher model out of that. So the targets here are not, are, are in, in this experiment are not real. Um, and then um, we use a student model, uh, linear model um, to learn off of that um, trained with MSE. And so again, this variance limited regime, you get, um, uh, kind of decent agreement with this exponent equal to one. And in this resolution limited regime, you get variable exponent um, depending on, on the, the data. So uh, to vary the problem here, what we did was downsample MNIST by various amounts. Um, and that changes um, kind of the, the, uh, the dimensionality of the, the manifold and also the kernel spectrum um, decay. 
Um, and then that controls the exponent. And that's how you're able to tune between these. But here you see in the variance limited regime, uh, you kind of get robustly the same exponent, um, even as you, you, mo you modify um, uh, the problem. Questions about this? So um, here uh, uh, is some, some more data uh, showing this. So um, these kernel spectra, um, where this is just a random fully connected deep network, um, they obey power laws, um, as you can see here, um, kind of fairly generically. And um, if you extract that exponent alpha k, again, here you can see that it gives a decent match with alpha d and alpha p. Um, just a question on the right hand side it's a log log scale right both yeah. so, um, so i have never seen any plot that is not linear in log log scale mm -hmm. i mean you can fit anything right uh, and it's going to be linear um if both x and y, right, both uh -huh. axes, you take uh, you know, log scale. I think it's very hard to differentiate uh -huh. between linear and nonlinear, right? Do you? Um, is what other um, evidence can I, I guess, provide? Um, so. Yeah, I guess. I mean, it's a it's a fair point. Um, if it's exponential, it won't look like this, but that's just about the only case. Uh, I mean, maybe, yeah. So, I mean, there is this, uh, you know, funny quotes about, you know, log like scales, right? So, you can, uh, uh, I can, I can fit a body in the log like scale, everything just, you know, it's, it's going to be squished, right? Yeah. No, that, that's, a, that's a fair point. I guess I don't have, a lot of our evidence was based off of, we thought numerically it was a decent approximation. Um, what I can say that um, in the cases where there are exact results on the spectra, usually they are um, for like NTK, um, for instance, uh, you can solve for the, um, like if you solve it on a sphere or something, you, um, <clears throat> Uh, you can get exact results there, but uh, but there you have to then, uh, one problem with that is that it inherits the degeneracy of the sphere. Um, so so those exact solutions, for instance, um, you, to kind of mimic real world data, you would need to break the degeneracy because, um, right. um, so you kind of see some of these in the, in the early, in the small eigenvalues, um, it doesn't, I mean, uh, it's more of a transient regime. You see some degeneracies here. Right. It's more that the tails we thought we, we kind of think are That's well um, approximated by, right. by power law. The only other thing I can say is we, um, we also wanted to relate this um, exponent because later in, we want to relate it to um, kind of a more manifold picture and dimensionality and so on. Um, because here it's governed by the kernel spectrum uh, or the kernel exponent, uh, there's some relation we think between also the, the kernel exponent and the dimensionality of the manifold. Um, and so there are these also like bounds um, dating uh, from, from uh, old um, math literature on um, like C to the T, like T times continuously differentiable kernels um, have these bounds. And so you kind of hope that uh, maybe in these settings, you you satisfy the bound if you don't for for a generic kernel, like if it has no other kind of symmetry properties and the data and so on, uh, then potentially like this bound uh, might be satisfied. So maybe that's the only other kind of. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I, you know like, what I would suggest maybe is that you know after I don't know the first ten right the ten smallest one right so. Maybe one of the axes should not be log, mm -hmm. and then, right, and then you can check whether it is linear or not. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, it, it's always hard for me to understand log. I mean, maybe it is only me. Like, if both axes they have log scales, then 
I think you know the behavior. You will see very similar behaviors for very different graphs. Uh huh. That that's a that's a fair point. Yeah. Um, I mean, I I suspect though that it like maybe the in there's a tilde here. So like as long as it doesn't have maybe exponential corrections, kind of you um, uh, as long as it's not exponential. I guess since since the kind of uh, you know we're also doing some fitting of the these exponents, which are also not necessarily exactly power law either. So I think it's kind of within some level of approximation. Uh, right. You know, like we're kind of distinguishing between maybe like rough behavior, like exponential, if it were exponential here, uh, how would it change the scaling power law here and so on. But even these fits that I kind of showed, you know, here they look quite nice, but in real data, um, um, uh, that also is maybe like, kind of from empirics. Uh, but yeah, thanks for that point. Um, so so that's just to say that we have some understanding from this case of, of that there's a variance limited regime and then that there's a resolution limited regime and that these exponents uh, are governed by these uh, kernel spectra. Um, and then we can test this in a more realistic setting. So now here, these are, this is just real, um, this is taking, uh, learned features from a model that's been pre-trained on ImageNet, so a different data set. They're not random features anymore. And we use that to construct features for CIFAR-10 um, and use the actual CIFAR-10 targets and then uh, train a linear classifier uh, on top of these features. And um, uh, yeah, and, and so this falls outside the, the theoretical setting that I mentioned on the on the previous slides, but um, here we also uh, kind of see at least a categorization of these um, uh, exponents. So you see variance limited on the diagonals, you see resolution limited on the off diagonals. Um, the reason you see these peaks are, that's kind of like the double descent peak uh, that you get when you uh, don't optimally regularize. And so this variance and resolution limited are basically, uh, you, you have resolution limited on one side of the double descent peak. And at some point you transition asymptotically to the variance limited regime on the other side. Um, here, you don't have those peaks, but you also still see kind of a rough duality between the exponents alpha P and alpha D being similar. This um, sort of breaks outside of this linear model setting. So in the more realistic, in the general neural network setting, we don't see uh, the duality in the exponents, the, the equality in the exponents. But um, that's kind of governed by how far you are from this uh, kind of linear models limit. So the more, presumably, the more feature learning you do, you're going to be farther from that. So this is like a, a, a more real world test case. Uh, that people commonly do in practice. Pre take a pre-trained model, uh, use it for a downstream task, and we kind of have some rough handle here. Okay, I'm sh I think I have only five minutes um, to finish. So I'm gonna say a few comments on the general setting. Um, the first is the variance limited scaling we have some handle on, so or, or we, we have some more formal results for. And um, we, uh, we also rely for this case on some of the known like leading finite width corrections to the infinite width limit. Um, so in this setting, we can kind of prove under pretty general conditions, general loss function that you will get this exponent equal to one um, asymptotically. Um, and so that's that's um, seems to be all good. Uh, the place where we don't have control um, is in this resolution limited scaling regime. And the lack of control, uh, uh, theoretical control really comes from because we don't understand the dynamics of neural networks too much uh, in, the, in the feature learning regime. Um, I will try to kind of give some heuristic uh, arguments um, or just kind of mental pictures for why you might um, expect still power law scaling and, and what the exponent might be. But here, I think there's more, there's more work to be done. So um, why did we come up with this term resolution limited? Um, again, it's sort of the, the, the idea being that the, one of the variables is 
when one of the variables is much smaller than the other, it's serving as the bottleneck and it's helping you resolve some manifold. And in particular, um, if you're, for instance, um, in an overparameterized regime where you're working in an interpolation limit and these points serve as you have D kind of training points, they serve as anchor points and uh, potentially you can, you might imagine um, that uh, you could do a, um, the test error at some nearby point is going to be controlled by its distance to the nearest neighbor point. So you could do, imagine doing some kind of series expansion for the test error at some point over here, not in the training set, based off of that. And I'll try to show some empirical results um, for, for that if I, if I manage to. Um, what I want, so this picture is quite, um, uh, you know, is many, it's familiar to many people. What I want to suggest is that that picture also holds sort of when you reverse it. So, and, and that there's some kind of relation between these two. So now when, um, uh, when, when D is quite large, uh, P is small, P is also kind of buying you, uh, you know, one degree of freedom on this manifold roughly and providing these anchor points that help you um, better resolve the manifold. That's maybe a reasonable picture based off, the, off of these other kind of results in the literature on the number of linear regions um, in realistic networks. Um, but uh, since I'm, I'm low on time, I'm gonna skip through some of this. Um, this other kind of heuristic picture that I mentioned where you do an expansion, um, a Taylor expansion, Again, that's something that's more familiar when you do the expansion in terms of um, amount of data, but kind of something similar seems to hold also when you when you view it as a function of model size. So um, if you imagine, again, looking at the, the test loss, the, the loss at a test point, um, if you're in this limit where, um, uh, you know, there are many such anchor points on your manifold, then the thing that really maybe governs um, your, um, uh, your test loss is this nearest neighbor distance and how that scales with amount of data or, or number of model parameters. So X, something like X test minus X hat train averaged over the data sets and data set. And so um, an expectation is that, uh, or maybe one just hypothesis is that to leading order, you would get something of this form. All the other terms would drop off you would get something that is power law in D or P. Um, and uh, generically, that power starts at four, n equals four for piecewise linear functions. So we have this prediction that maybe four over D, whether you look at data set or model size scaling might work in this very asymptotic regime. Um, and so here, the kind of moving parts are trying to relate the test error to the scaling of the nearest neighbor distance on some manifold. I'm cheating a bit here and I'm not telling you which manifold, like should you, or, or which space you're working in. Is this the input space or is it the learned feature space? Is it the, the feature space of learned NTK features? Um, and uh, in, in my limited time, probably I won't go into the nuances of that, um, but we, we tried to make these estimates based off of um, just directly looking at the scaling of nearest neighbor distances in the penultimate layer of a train network. So that's kind of a rough approximation also to like NTK features. And you could look at the, the, the scaling of nearest neighbor distance with data set size or model size, extract an exponent from that and have that be a rough measure of what this effective dimensionality is. Um, and this was uh, kind of a, a, a first pass at a test to see uh, whether this four over D that I mentioned uh, kind of guess that you might have would work or not. Um, for teacher student models, it works pretty well. Um, this is this plot is showing four over alpha D, the four over D relationship for data set size scaling. And this plot on the right is showing it for model size. Um, so for teacher student models, there tends to be decent agreement for realistic models in the wild, wild like a CNN or a ResNet, uh, it's kind of off by a bit, um, it, but, but it kind of, there is maybe some general trend between this distance scaling, the dimensionality and these exponents. Um, 
I'll skip over this. I was going to show some other empirical results from the literature that maybe also suggest some relationship between um, looking at like penultimate layers of the network, measuring distances there. You could measure, try to estimate dimensionality directly, not using this nearest neighbor scaling, but using other older like geometric algorithms. Um, and so these are all things that I think um, uh, you know, we we took we did some study of it, but it um, would benefit from from more investigation. Um, this is my last slide, I think, uh, which is more just um, that. That's kind of so. Actually, I can I take two more minutes, or go, yeah, go ahead. Uh... Um, another thing that we studied a little bit. Um, and I thought was interesting was how robust are these exponents to var varying the, the task. So if you take a task like CIFAR 100 and you superclass it, um, uh, that shifts it up and down. So note here, I didn't subtract off anything. Um, that does change the bare value, but it didn't change the exponent drastically. Um, but if you add noise to the inputs, do the same experiment, but add noise, um, uh, you find that the exponent varies quite a lot. And maybe that sort of suggests that uh, what neural networks are mostly learning are something that's more tied to properties of the input manifold rather than the actual task. So it's more sort of like a type of unsupervised learning that's going on in the internal layers of the model in that they're, they're much more susceptible to this. Uh, this is... Uh, they're much more robust to kind of certain types of uh, of shifts, and um, maybe what they're doing is really just modeling the input manifold. And in, in, um, uh, so I'll leave I'll leave that there. Um, so as you kind of saw, what we have is um, a, sort of a categorization of exponents based on mechanisms. This variance limited regime, um, we have a handle on fully. The resolution limited regime, we only have a handle on in the student teacher model. And then we have some kind of uh, 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 kind of hypotheses for how to how to think about it in a more general case and what to measure. Um, there are still a lot of questions that remain. Um, to what extent are architectural advancements uh, helping us? Because you see <clears throat> sometimes in experiments that different architectures actually scale the same way. So are they just shifting us up and down, but the scaling is kind of set inherently by more by features of the data set? Um, <clears throat> can we explicitly control the exponent? Um, the domain matters. So right now in image classification, we observe much better exponents than in NLP. And uh, maybe this sort of suggests that we don't have quite the right models for NLP because these numbers I showed at the very beginning from the open AI paper were quite small. They were like less than 0.1. And, um, and then there's a whole series of problems where there isn't even predictable scaling um, as they also discuss in the GPT-3 paper. Okay, um, I'd like to thank my collaborators. Um, I, we will post a V2 shortly that will have some of the more um, recent results <coughs> formalized. And um, thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for this very clear talk. Uh, definitely, uh, uh, you know, it ignites uh, uh, some uh, questions, right? And, uh, you know, what are uh, uh, some of the people in the audience uh, uh, are interested in solving some of, you know, many of the questions you brought up uh, rigorously. Uh, so it was, uh, yeah, very well placed talk. Uh, we have asked many questions, but, uh, you know, if there are others who would like to ask questions, I think uh, they can do that now if Yasemin has time. I have one more question, if nobody else has. Yes. Did I understand you correctly that the scaling uh, diagrams help you understand the intrinsic dimension of the data? Yes. Um, so, uh, or they're, they seem to be governed by that. In, in this sort of picture, or this is like one other 
uh, hypothesis for how you would go about this, uh, trying to get a, um, in this resolution limited scaling limit, kind of do a Taylor expansion, do a series expansion, for instance, for the test points. So um, yes, the, the intrinsic dimension comes up here. Um, what I was kind of, uh, what, what we don't have quite full support for is where that, in, in which space should you measure that? So is that in the input manifold or is it like in the learned feature space? What set of features should you use? Is it the last layer of features? Um, one, one thing that I think is very natural is, <clears throat> but requires more empirical exploration is that um, you can kind of view every neural network as um, every learned model as having some kernel, whether it's the last layer kernel or it's the NTK learned kernel. And those also you could go study like the spectra of the of the learned models, um, or also here measure these um, intrinsic dimensionalities. And I think it's those quantities, um, this connection between dimensionality, kernel spectra, and the uh, data set and model size exponents. We have a kind of clear circle of how to connect those in the student teacher setting, and we have some of these connections filled in for the for the more general setting, but not fully. Sorry. But for, for data sets that I haven't seen before, I wouldn't know how what the interesting dimension is. That's right. That's, uh, yes, that's completely uh, accurate. So maybe I should, um, I can elaborate on that. Yeah, so this would, this would um, require you, this would, this is saying like, can I know what the exponent is if I'm allowed to make measurements uh, of some quantity in the learned model. Um, but I can't, it's hard to predict that at the outset right now in this more okay. general thing. Yeah. Thank you. If there is no more questions, maybe we can. Uh, I'll we'll thank uh, uh, our speakers again and, uh, you know, finish this uh, seminar.